titled Oral HPV, Sex and Cancer, The Bridge from Math to Medicine. The next cube brings together faculty and students from the medical school, the School of Public Health, and the Department of Mathematics in the College of LSNA. Please welcome Professors Thomas Carey, Raphael Meza, and Marissa Eisenberg. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Carey, and I'm here with my CUBE colleagues, Marissa and Raphael. We formed this CUBE to study transmission of HPV and the risk of cancer development. Since the 1840s, it has been postulated that cervical cancer was ca uh, caused by an infectious agent and that was sexually transmitted because women who had many partners were prone to get cervical cancer, but women who were celibate did not. And <clears throat> As we, um, excuse me, here we got the slides moving on their own. Um, it wasn't until 140 years later that the causative factor of cervical cancer, human uh, papillomavirus, which is shown as the little purple balls here, was identified as the primary cause of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer affects 530,000 people in the world every year. It's a very highly infectious, contagious uh, virus, and people become infected with HPV shortly after they become sexually active. In fact, the majority of people are infected at some time in their life. What's less well known is that uh, high-risk HPV also causes oropharynx cancer. And during 2013, I apologize for my mic, uh, the incidence of oral pharyngeal cancer will surpass that of cervical cancer in the United States. The blue part is the oropharynx cancer, the green part is the cervical cancer, the other slices of the pie are other anogenital HPV-related diseases. You might not know what we're talking about with the oropharynx, but the pharynx is the area that's surrounded by the green box that you can see on the slide behind me, and the oropharynx is the part in the middle that starts at the back of the mouth and includes the tonsils. When you open your mouth wide and if you haven't had a tonsillectomy, you can see the tonsils on either side of your tongue guarding the entrance to your upper digestive tract. In addition, there's also another tonsil that hardly anyone knows about on the base of the tongue called the lingual tonsil. Um, we believe, and is good evidence to show this, that the tonsil is the reservoir of high-risk HPV in the upper digestive tract. The virus uh, infects the crypts of the tonsil. All right. Do I shut this one off? Or? Oh, okay. Um, you can hear me? Okay, great. Um, and in the diagram, you can see the crypts are these deep invaginations down into the tonsil. The virus hides there, it replicates, and it goes on to infect another individual. With time, the virus infection will be cleared, but the virus may remain latent in the cell. In a small portion of cases, the virus integrates into the cellular DNA and causes a tumor. And these tumors are fortunately relatively easy to treat. However, we use very intensive therapy, and it's tough on the person. So um, we're trying to move toward much less intensive therapy, but we already have 20% of the people who progress with this very intensive um, therapy. And so we need to understand what are the differences between the patients who respond well and those who progress. And in addition, because of my work in oral pharynx cancer and HPV, I get emails all the time. One came from a uh, student shortly after I gave a lecture in the dental school who asked me, um, my boyfriend and I were both virgins, but after we had intercourse, my doctor told me that I had an HPV infection. How did I get it? Another young man from Italy wrote to me and he said, I've been told that I have oral pharynx cancer that's caused by HPV, and I need to know, will this treatment cure me, or will I die of this disease? Um, we don't know the answers to all of these questions, and the M-Cube came along just in time for us to team up with Marissa and Raphael to begin to investigate some of these important questions. Actually, let me take this. 
Um, this, I think my mic is okay. So, um, yeah, so thanks, Tom. So, uh, as Tom was saying, there are a ton of open questions and things that we just don't understand, and addressing those questions requires a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and part of the reason for that is that there's a huge gap in our understanding of the link between oropharyngeal, or, pardon me, oral HPV and oropharyngeal cancer. And it's an interesting contrast with cervical cancer, um, where for, for cervical cancer, we actually actually can, can watch the progression from normal tissue to HPV infection to lesions all the way to cancer, right? So your annual pap smear, you can actually detect these things as they develop, and that gives us two things. One, it gives us good data that go, spans that complete progression, and then two, it also means that you can actually cure patients before they reach the cancer stage. The picture for oropharyngeal cancer is quite different. Um, so here, we don't get this information, and oftentimes the first sign of trouble is actually the cancer itself. Um, and so in order to bridge this gap, this data gap, um, we needed to take a multidisciplinary approach that takes data from multiple different scales and integrates it into a single framework. And so the, this is just a diagram illustrating the framework that I'm talking about and how there are multiple different scales interacting. So up on the top uh, left, I guess, for you guys, you'll see we have population level HPV transmission. And so there, we have students who've developed assays so that we can actually test H oral HPV in the population. And then once an individual is infected with oral HPV, then we go down to the intracellular level, where now we have intracellular viral carcinogenesis and the process by which HPV actually causes cancer. And we're inf investigating that by looking at tissue samples, looking at tumor samples, and characterizing HPV, DNA, and RNA. And then from there, we go back up to the population level to look at population level trends of oropharyngeal cancer in the, in, in the population. Um, and so but we, need, we have all these different sets of data. We need to pull them together into one framework so that we can draw conclusions. And for that, we're using mathematical models. And so we're actually building models that pull these different data sets together in a bunch of different ways, some of them looking at particular processes, and then some of them integrating across all of these different scales. And so I just want to show you one quick example of one of our integrated models. And so here you can see the model results there on the top left in red and the data in blue. And that's, so that's HPV prevalence by age. And you can see that the model matches the data pretty well. And then down here on the bottom right, we have uh, oropharyngeal cancer incidence by age. And again, you see that the model matches the data pretty well. But what's cool is that you can actually, so we're, we're modeling a whole population, and you can actually track. So over here on the bottom left, you have individual trajectories of when people get HPV infections and how that affects their cancer risk as they age. And so um, to tell you a little more about the impact, I'm going to pass it to Rafael. So what have we done, and, and where are we going with this? So, so first of all, as, as part of the QV, we already have some very exciting preliminary findings. Uh, first of all, uh, we, one of our students has developed a laboratory assays and tests that allow us to sort of characterize what is HPV doing in cancer cells, where does the gene, HPV genes get inserted into, into the cellular genome, in what chromosomes, in what genes. And we hypothesize that that way we'll be able to sort of characterize those tumors that respond to therapy therapy versus those who don't, and in the future be able to uh, help guide treatment decisions and, and patient management. Of, uh, like Marisa was saying, we've also been able to develop integrated models that try to connect what happens at HPV transmission in the population level with what happens inside an individual, with then back what happens with cancer rates at the population level back again. We've also been sort of trying to characterize patterns of uh, oral and genital HPV infection at the population level and by age and by birth cohort or generations and see how those those correlate with patterns of oropharyngeal cancer rates and trends as well at the population level. And that has allowed us to identify uh, certain generations or groups, like for example, uh, baby boomers who have been uh, predominantly affected by HPV with high rates of infection as well as high rates of oropharyngeal cancer. Uh, one of the biggest impacts that of our cube, our cube, sorry, has been the, the opportunity to work with a truly amazing group of students, uh, Andrew Bauer, uh, who is developing some of the HPV transmission models, uh, Mikiko Senga, whose uh, PhD research comparing oral HPV prevalence between people with HIV and people without HIV was really crucial to get us going. Uh, Heather Wallin, 
who developed some of the assay, uh, laboratory assays that I described to characterize what HPV is doing in cancer cells, and Pritikeras Gupta, who has been developing uh, systems biology models of, of cellular regulatory networks and RNA expression. Uh, another important outcome of our cube is an uh, application that we put together in response to a uh, 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 call uh, to, to, to develop proposals to bridge, uh, bridge the gap between cancer mechanisms and population sciences. So this call for funding from NIH was perfect for our cube, and thanks to our cube, we were able to quickly respond and put an application together. Uh, it's currently under review. We've been told that we're within striking distance of getting this funded, so we hope we will, and that will provide us with five years of funding and about $4 million. Ah, so in closing, so what we hope is that the cube is, is like the first step in a journey that will take us to a place where we understand or increase our understanding of the links between infectious agents and cancer, and that way help us develop better treatment and cancer prevention and control strategies. So for instance, who should we vaccinate against HPV? When should we do it? Uh, should we combine oral screening that you get at the dental dentist office with maybe HPV testing or oral HPV testing? And as well, with the goal of reducing disparities in HPV and cancer risk that exist. So for instance, we know that African Americans are at high risk of, of HPV infection, and that minorities tend to get infected by uh, HPV types that are not in the vaccines and therefore are not protected by vaccination. So anyhow, thank you for your attention and that's it.